On the Oklahoma Newsroom, it is time for Orange Alert, our weekly extended look at Cowboy football. I'm Jenny Carlson here in studio with fellow columnist Barry Trammell and OSU beat writer Scott Wright. Guys, we are just about a week away from kickoff. Cowboys opening on Thursday night against Missouri State. And obviously, quarterbacks, even though it's been settled to a point, has continued to be a point of conversation. Scott, let's talk about uh, the news that came out uh, over the weekend. Mike Gundy making uh, his announcement about who is in what position on the depth chart. Taylor Cornelius staying at the top, but Drew Brown in that second backup role. Um, it's still There's still a lot of questions, though, about that. Is he truly the number two? Is he going to play some against Missouri State? Flesh some of this out for us if you can. That, that remains the really big question that we've got to figure out. Not, not necessarily us, but yeah. Mike Gundy has to figure out how he wants to handle this. Do yeah. you uh, do you go to uh, into the first game and uh, know that you want to get your your number two guy some snaps in case you need him in two weeks later against Boise? Uh, you know that, those are the questions they've got to they've got to debate. Do they want to try to save him and only play him in four games, redshirt him, and bring him back next year? A lot of stuff that they've got to figure out how to uh, to maneuver this season. Um, obviously, they want to. Go ahead and get Spencer Sanders into four games somewhere along the line. They still want to save that redshirt year for him. Uh, so they've got four years of him and coming back next year in 2019 as well. So a lot of things that they've got to, to try to monitor, see what they can do. Um, you know, Mike Gunny made it very clear that, that Keandre Wooty is the number four guy on the depth chart right now, uh, but he's the guy that doesn't have a redshirt year to burn. So, uh, you know, if you're going to try to save those other guys, he's the one that you're going to see on the field uh, in some uh, some mop up roles and, uh, and backup situations. So, uh, it's going to be really interesting to see just how Mike Gundy and Mike Yurcich use these quarterbacks to figure out what they're going to do going forward with them. Well, it is a great mystery, Barry, because the question becomes, if Drew Brown is redshirted, is he a Cowboy again next year? I mean, if he only plays in those four games, do they still have him? Uh, Scott, it sounds like you have some indication he'd like to win the job. You'll be writing about that in the coming days. But um, Barry, I mean, if you're in Mike Gundy's situation, how do you how do you uh, you know how do you approach all this? Well, I think Mike Gundy was given a a, a big time gift by the NCAA uh, rules committee when they put in the new red shirt rule. It worked perfectly with uh, with the situation for Oklahoma State. Without that rule, then Gundy and his staff have to do all kinds of of juggling. But now they've they're able to uh, to go ahead and play. Taylor Cornelius uh, as the starter and, and see what happens, but they can also mix and match getting in Sanders and Drew Brown. And as long as they don't go over that four game limit, they've got the best of both worlds and, and they retain a, a year of eligibility and uh, uh, don't lose an, a year of eligibility. So uh, this is a much easier situation to deal with. Um, I think what you'll see, especially these first two weeks, you got South Alabama and Missouri State, two teams the Cowboys ought to handle pretty easily. So what you do is, uh, you know, when the game's in hand uh, and, and you feel like Cornelius has had enough work, you get one or both of those guys in the game. Maybe one, one week, one the next is ideal. So that way uh, they get a little feel, you see what you've got, and, and you proceed from there. So this is a, uh, you know, in years past, this would have been a much tougher job for uh, Mike Gundy's staff. Well, and the, the, as you mentioned, that red shirt rule change, it's changed everything, Scott. And, and, you know, the fact that Drew Brown comes in after three years at Hawaii, having redshirted one, he has two remaining, which that's rarely the case with grad transfers. So that just brings in a whole other layer of question marks and how are they going to balance this? As I mentioned, you have some indication that Drew Brown doesn't necessarily want to redshirt. He's not necessarily opposed to it, though. So what are you hearing, and, and what do we know about that situation? Well, yeah, like you said, it's really interesting to have a graduate transfer come in in this, in this scenario where you've got two years to play one final season of football. It doesn't happen a lot um, in this situation. It, uh, it, it could work out really good for both Drew Brown and Oklahoma State. Um, I, I spoke with his best friend, uh, his former college roommate out at Hawaii, Kyle Gallup, who uh, is still in very tight communication with uh, with Drew Brown on a, on an almost daily basis about his situation? Uh, you know, obviously Drew Brown off the limits to the media this this uh, this season as a first year player, uh, but but Kyle Gallup, his best friend, says. You know, he's still competing. He wants to win this job this season. But if it doesn't happen, if he does end up redshirting, uh, he's ready to come back next year and uh, and compete for the job with Spencer Sanders starting in 2019. So uh, he's a uh, he's a very competitive guy. He had a uh, a little bit of a, a rough spell after uh, you know he realized that he wasn't going to be the starter in game one, uh, but he uh, he 
put that behind him pretty quickly and uh, and is moving forward as the uh, the number two guy trying to go win that job. Yeah, and you know, it's interesting that two years to play one, Barry, I mean, usually these grad transfers come in and you know they're going to play and they're going to be done. That's it. They've got one year left. Uh, you know, I assume if he red shirts, he's good to go. I mean, there's nothing that would say that that wouldn't be the case. But this is, I mean, in addition to this red shirt rule, which coaches are saying, we're not sure how we're going to use it. Then they've got this added issue with Drew Brown having these two years. It's really, uh, there's a lot of uh, calculus, I guess, at play here for the coaches. Yeah, and you know what? I, to me, it's a good thing. Um, it, it, it's a form of free agency for college football players, which coaches have it. I don't know why players shouldn't have it. But uh, uh, another thing, it's, it's uh, incentivizing. It's, it's motivating these guys to graduate in three years. Graduate in three years, and if you've redshirted, you'll have two more to play. If you haven't redshirted, you have two to, to fit in one. Um, I, I like everything about this rule, and we're seeing it with Drew Brown. Uh, I don't know if he'll beat out Taylor Cornelius. I tend to say no. I think Cornelius is going to keep the job all year. But if you know Drew Brown comes here, doesn't, doesn't win the job, he can, he can win it next year. So, I mean, to me, it's an added bonus. I like the rule. It, it adds fun to the season. I mean, it's a lot of strategy, a lot of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of uh, coaching uh, mechanisms that the, the general public gets to sort of sort through and say, hey, what would you do here? So, I like everything about it, and it gives coaches and players a lot more options. Yeah, it, it really does. And I, as Barry said, you know, Taylor Cornelius may be the guy the whole season. Scott, I assume that's probably the dream scenario is if he comes out and plays so well that the Cowboys don't need to think about having one of these other guys play a, a full-time role. Yeah, exactly. That's, uh, that's, the, that's the perfect opportunity or the perfect scenario for Oklahoma State. Taylor Cornelius comes out, plays the way that they feel like he's capable of, stays healthy, keeps the job all year, and then uh, you get both Spencer Sanders and Drew Brown in some action, bring them both back next year. That would be ideal. Uh, you know, the schedule sets up perfect for, for Taylor Cornelius to gain some momentum early, gain, gain some confidence. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a really good scenario if, uh, if things can stay on track. Things don't always stay on track, though. <laughs> That's true. Uh, Barry, you say you think Taylor Cornelius is going to be the guy throughout the year. There's a lot of people that I think are a little more skeptical of Taylor Cornelius. Why do you think that is? A couple of things. Why? They're skeptical yeah. or why am I excited about Well, let's about start it? with other people being skeptical. Well, he's a walk-on. I think uh, it's a natural bias against walk-ons. We hear walk-on, we think the guy's not any good. Now, we've had people fall out of the trees, Baker Mayfield, Brandon Whedon, all kinds of examples. But Taylor Cornelius is sort of a traditional walk-on in that he just showed up at OSU. Uh, and, and worked his way up and, and has been a valuable member of the team for several years, and, uh, but he hasn't got to play in any kind of meaningful situation, and people still remember the, the lack of recruiting credentials, and I think they hold that against him. I'm excited about him because I don't think he would have been kept around for five years if he wasn't a, uh, a prospect. I don't think he would have been the backup the last couple of years if he couldn't throw the ball. Mike Gundy's not trotting out a quarterback who can't throw. That's not going to happen. So I think Taylor Cornelius can throw. I think he's clearly a solid citizen, a sharp guy, or he wouldn't have been kept around. And he's got a lot of weapons around him. The OSU offense is established. It's set in stone. They know what they're doing offensively. So he's not going to be Mason Rudolph. They're not going to have that caliber, caliber of quarterback. But I think Taylor Cornelius is more than capable of producing good quarterback play. A lot of those things you just mentioned, are those the reasons why you think he'll maintain that starting spot throughout the year? Yeah, he's got, and, and even if even if the uh, Drew Brown or even uh, Sanders have a, have a talent edge, um, they're coming from so far back. Um, you know, if they'd have been here in the spring, maybe, but, uh, you know, Drew Brown wasn't even here in the summer to work with the guys in, in, the, in the summer drills. So, he is starting from so far back, I don't see any way Unless Taylor Cornelius just plays terrible, I don't see any way Drew Brown can beat him out this season. Well, Scott, it seems like if you had a, a guy that did uh, brought to the table what uh, Sanders and Brown in concert bring, Brown with his experience at Hawaii, Sanders with his summer uh, months in Stillwater, maybe you get a contender, but 
that didn't happen. Those are separate guys that are coming from uh, Sanders being a true freshman and Brown, as Barry said, not getting on campus until very late. That probably is going to be a hard, hard thing to come back from for either of those guys. Yeah, it, it absolutely is. And that's the big reason that, uh, you know, even by the middle of July, we were hearing Mike Gunny say that, that Taylor Cronius is, quote, our guy going into uh, going into, into preseason camp because he had he had been in that room, in that quarterback room with Mason Rudolph and Mike Yersich for four years, absorbing so much of this offense. Um, Gunny said on Sunday that Cornelius knows this offense as, as well as any quarterback that has come through here because he's been around it for so long and, and been around so many good players. Um, so yeah, for for Drew Brown or Spencer Sanders to uh, to try to match that in just uh, a couple of months uh, was uh, was was such a, a high hurdle to try to climb. It was uh, it was it was going to be really difficult. Yeah, for sure. Well, lots of lots of intrigue. We'll see what happens in Missouri State because there's going to be a point when they're they're ready to bring Taylor Cornelius out of that game. Who goes in? How long are they in for? What happens? That's all very interesting to see what happens on Thursday night. Uh, guys, let's talk a little bit about the defensive side of the ball because, you know, obviously replacing as much as the Cowboys lost on offense has been a consistent, uh, you know, theme throughout this offseason with Mason Rudolph, the receivers being, being gone, but the defense changing over. Jim Knowles bringing in a different philosophy, changing how things are going to be set up out there. Barry, what do you think the biggest challenge early on for that defense will be? A couple of opponents starting out that aren't great, so I don't know if we're going to really have a, a true sense of where things are. What are the challenges, though, as you see it for this new defense? Well, I think um, got, the Cowboys have some things going for them. I, th I think, uh, to me, linebacker depth is sort of the problem, except here's Jim Knowles. He's cut a linebacker out of the equation. He's gone to a 4-2-5 base which means he needs one fewer linebacker in, in the majority of alignments. So that helps right away. Uh, I think this Oklahoma State defense can be better. The line is solid. Not going to be great. It's not going to be maybe what we saw in 2011 or even what we saw 2015-16, but uh, going to be solid. And the secondary should be very good. You know, the, the Cowboys had to live with those young corners, Rodarius Williams, A.J. Green, last fall. That's going to pay off now. So I sort of like this Oklahoma State defense. I don't think it's going to be TCU level. I don't think it's going to be Texas level. But I do think it could be improved. And if this defense is improved, all of a sudden the chances of, of OSU having a very nice win total go up. Scott, as I mentioned, these first couple games, not great opponents, uh, Missouri State, South Alabama. What do you feel like are going to be the marks or the ways that Jim Knowles and his staff and these players are going to be able to look at things and say, all right, we like what we see, or this needs fixing. What are some of those things that you feel like are going to be ways that they're going to be measuring this defense against less than stellar opponents? You know, honestly, it's going to be a lot of stuff that, that we don't even really recognize. It's going to be, um, you know, making certain reads, making sure that guys are aligned properly, uh, things that, uh, that, that us just looking on, not knowing the intricacies of the defense, aren't going to fully understand. Uh, but when they get into, uh, into film on, uh, on the day after the game, there's going to be a lot of discussion about what, uh, what the little things were that were missed. Uh, Jim Knowles is a, uh, is a bit of a perfectionist in that way. Uh, you know, he wants to see his guys lining up correctly. He wants the guys uh, making the right calls. Uh, that's where a guy like Kenneth Edison Magruder moving from linebacker to safety has been a, a huge help. Uh, Knowles has sort, of, uh, sort of relies on him as the quarterback of the defense in a way, making sure the guys are, are aligned properly back there on, uh, from, the, uh, from the back end especially. Um, and he's and he's the uh, the veteran uh, of that uh, of that secondary now is the uh, is the only senior in that group, so um, you know those little things lining up properly, making the right reads are going to be the things that uh, that are really important in those first two games, and uh, and then beyond that it'll be it'll be simple things like making tackles when you have the opportunity, or uh, um, you know for the cornerbacks or the safeties in coverage, making sure that you're uh, that you're turning when the ball is coming, or, uh, or making play on the ball when you have the opportunity. So uh, those are the things that are that are really going to stand out uh, from uh, from the very start. You got to get uh, got to gain a little bit of confidence, get ready for that Boise State game in uh, in week three. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Barry, as you think about the players that it looks like Jim Knowles is going to use, uh, Scott talks about the guys in the secondary. Is there a player that you feel like, or a couple players you feel like maybe most in the crosshairs, the, sort of the, the, the points that will determine where this defense may succeed or, or may fall short? Well, I think uh, the two linebackers, Calvin Brundage 
uh, Justin Phillips, particularly Phillips, uh, they need to play well. Um, you know, the, uh, the Cowboys uh, have, have not always had top shelf linebacking, but when they've had, it, it's paid off big time. And I think Phillips and Brundage are, are uh, capable of, of doing well. And if they do, that's great. The linemen, they've got some nice players. Uh, Brailford, Owens, Trey Carter, Walter Scheid, those are solid guys that you can count on. And like I said, I think the secondary is going to be solid. If those linebackers can play at a high level, and we're pro primarily talking about those two, yeah. then I like uh, then I like the uh, the uh, development of the OSU defense. Scott, a lot's been made of the secondary, as you mentioned. You know, more guys back there. They've lost those safeties that were you know so long in the program uh, in Flowers and and Richards last year. So such a point of emphasis, but. Did they get enough pressure on the quarterback last year? I mean, I think what they've done on the defensive line historically since Joe Bob Clements has been there has been big time because that used to be such a weak position. Now it's not. It's consistently very good. But do they need to get more pressure on the quarterback and get more sacks this season? Yeah, they do. That's a, that's a big part of what, uh, of what Jim Knowles likes to do in this defense. He likes to, uh, to be able to put some pressure on the quarterback. That enables him to, uh, to use his pressure man coverage on the outside for his cornerbacks, and that, and that, uh, that helps. The, it all works together. The whole process uh, flows better that way if they get some pressure on the quarterback. Uh, that's why I think you could see a, a guy like Jordan Brelford maybe in line for a uh, for a real breakout year as a junior this season. He's their uh, he's I think their most talented pass rusher. He's their fastest guy uh, in that uh, in that group. They got a couple of uh, solid defensive tackles up in, uh, in the front line with with Trey Carter and Darian Daniels. I think to help out in the middle, um, try to keep him uh, free off of the edge. Uh, I think that he has a chance to be a, a guy who could really excel this season. Lastly, I want to do a little shameless plug and promotion here. Our college football preview section is coming out on Sunday, so be sure to grab one of those. It's got schedules. It's got all sorts of great stuff about the teams, but one of the things that we do every year is predict. Um, guys, let's talk about this season. How many wins do you think the Cowboys get in, Barry? Well, now you got me on the spot because I don't. Uh, it's in the uh, it's in the football preview, and <laughs> now I'm trying remember. to remember. But yeah, it's I, been a while since our our, our copy yes. deadline for that. Yeah, right, so I don't right. want to say one number and then somebody and then have another number in the paper and say you're trying to cover all bases. I think I picked the Cowboys to go nine and three though. Okay. And um, if you win your bowl game, that's ten and three. So um, I, I think OSU is capable of ten and three. Well, nine point six wins a year the last decade. They've set a standard for how they play, and I think despite the loss of Mason Rudolph, they can, they can get close to that this season. Scotty? I'm at, I'm at that 10-win mark uh, as well. I think that uh, you know, last year, 10 wins was, uh, was a bit of a disappointment. Sure. I think this team, it would be um, uh, borderline overachieving, um, at, least, at least a little bit to get to 10 wins, but I think it's definitely uh, a possibility. I think they can get there. Okay, I'll ask you a couple more questions that people will find in there as a little bit of a tease. Uh, most valuable player. Who's the most valuable player on this team? Scotty, I'll let you go first. I think it's Justice Hill. I, I think we get to the end of the season and, and we're going to have we're going to have seen something really special out of this out of this guy he's uh, you know maybe he's gone to the NFL after this who knows but uh, I, I think that uh, he's going to have the type of year that puts him in position to do that and and we're going to be looking at him as as the star of this team and the most valuable player yeah I think he's the best player out there Barry is he the MVP at the end of the year well you know what I don't, can't remember what I said in the paper <laughs> but I, I I'll throw caution to win I think I'm going to say uh, Taylor Cornelius okay. um you know, I think uh, if he plays the way I think he's going to play, which is good, solid quarterbacking, then that's going to be real valuable. Justice Hill is a wonderful tailback, one of the best in America. But they got some other good tailbacks, too. So, if, you know, if, if he is uh, out for any length of time, uh, Cowboys aren't decimated. Taylor Cornelius could be very valuable to this football team. All right, lots of predictions, lots of advanced before the season stuff in that preview section. You're going to want to get one on Sunday, hold on to it all year. It's going to have information that you'll want in there throughout the season. And, of course, our picks. If you want to call us on any of them at the end of the year, feel free. Be sure to stay with the best coverage team anywhere at newsok.com and every day in the Oklahoma.